detaching from our stories is a difficult thing to do because the stories that we develop are one of the strategies that we're attached to to help us guide our way through the situation. And the idea that I would drop that story can leave me with an internal feeling of a void and a degree of vulnerability that I am not ready to be experiencing. And so my story provides me with a little bit of buffering and scaffolding that I feel like I'm needing in the situation in order to navigate it well. And it makes sense that we would have a resistance to not relying on that because it has for many, many years informed my decision making in my life. So it does, it, it is a challenge sometimes to d detach. The other place where this is a problem for me is when I am convinced that I'm right. <laughs> Not only is this my story, but it is the truth with a capital T. And, you know, that's where I, and that's why I say if I think that there's a problem with you, I'm going to get self-righteous because then I'm really going to hunker down in my story and there's not going to be a lot of wiggle room in there. Um, the piece I want to offer you with that is we're not concerned at this point whether your story is right or wrong. It doesn't matter. Okay? It really doesn't matter whether you have an accurate view of the situation or not at this point. It's that I know what my story is and I'm able to articulate and track my story and I also have the observer self that I'm developing over here that is able to observe my story. Because if I can do that, I can begin working with it differently and I'm setting myself up for allowing more shifting in a dialogue. If I can't get into the observational frame, it's going to be very difficult for us to have a nonviolent or compassion-based conversation because my attachment to my evaluation is going to block me. That, and we're not at a place yet where we care whether it's right or wrong. We want to start at a place of shared reality. So observation gives me an entry point into a conversation where we can begin at shared reality. That's what I'm looking for at the outset. Your story about me and my story about you, we will get to that later, the, the working with that. But when we start talking, I want to position myself as much as I can that we are starting on the same block if that makes sense. And so in my silly example with Brett, it would be, if I was going to have a conversation about that later, it would be, remember this morning when you came into the room holding the frying pan and said, what is this? And what I'm looking for in the opening of that, the skillful opening of that conversation, is that he would say, yeah, and I haven't stimulated his defensiveness. Okay. If I start the conversation with, um, remember how you rudely awakened me this morning with your anger? I'm, I'm going to start stimulating a buffer in him. There's going to be resistance already. So what I'm looking for in this dialectic are the words that I can articulate where we are on the same page in a, in a place of openness. And whatever that language sounds like is going to be the quote unquote right language for, for this piece. Questions on it? Anything, questions or comments? Yes. I have a comment. I'm also working on something that's not black and white. <laughs> and one of the things that I noticed is the number of things I don't know. I love that. When we detach from the story, we begin to see how much we don't know. And what I love about that is it allows me, if I'm willing to let it, it allows me to move into a place of curiosity which supports <coughs> compassion and connection and is very different than control. If I'm certain that I already have all the data that I need and that I know everything, then I'm going to want to act upon you, right? And if I am willing to acknowledge that I have my story, which is 50%, if I'm going to be generous with myself, of the data, and there's a whole bunch of information I don't yet know, we are already having a different kind of conversation in which I'm willing to discover something new in myself and in the other person. 
And that is the, you know, the, the rich, fertile soil out of which we move to collaboration, co-creation, interdependence, dialogue, and away from domination. Yes. I have a question for you then. Yes. She's the problem. <laughs> Here's what I love about your question. It gives me the opportunity to say, you are never going to, using this, avoid people feeling and perceiving things. And so the first piece is that you stop worrying or caring in, in the old way, in the controlling way. You stop being attached to, might be a better way of putting it, how somebody else is perceiving you or what it is that they may be thinking you're doing. Because for the rest of your life, people are going to project their story onto you. So you get comfortable with that. And then I would say, um, instead of trying to prevent that from happening, this will give you tools for embracing that when it happens. Because inevitably, people are bringing their programming to every situation. And it, this is a model about embracing whatever is and working with it more effectively, not about um, showing up in the situation in some perfect template so that nobody is ever upset with me or, mis or misunderstands me. <laughs> do, do you see the shift? You assume people are going to be upset with me. They are going to misunderstand me. They are not going to understand what I'm saying. They're going to put intentions on me that are not true to who I am. That is the nature of human relationships. How do I like relax into that and surf that wa wave and work with it effectively? So then when she comes to me, I've done this lovely thing and I've gotten in new information and I'm really modeling the kind of openness that I'm wanting her to learn a little bit from indirectly. And then she gets upset with me later and gives me some feedback that that was really painful for her. Then I reorient and I welcome and I just work with that. And then what I do is I say, so it sounds like what's important to you is whatever that is. And it sounds like you're needing some reassurance that there's going to be effective action. And it sounds like you're really, um, there's some trust coming up for you about where I'm headed with this. And so then I just work with that. No problem. How does that? And uh, yes, you see, because I have to, the inner work for me is I don't take it personally. Because the moment that I start thinking, oh, I did it wrong, I'm going to want to defend and explain it. And then she's likely not to get her needs met. Or the moment that I think, you know, you misunderstood me. Why didn't you, you're not understanding. Then I'm going to try and educate her when that's likely not what she's needing in that situation. But that's the old frame. If I'm thinking through what's wrong with me or what's wrong with her, my strategies are going to be aligned with a frame that is not going to be the most effective one in the situation. So the inner work for me is to step out of taking it personally, which, I, which paradoxically increases my capacity to be sensitized to the impact it's having on me and to use that data to act more effectively in the situation. But in a domination system, what we're taught to do with our feelings are numb them out or act them out. And so what we're wanting to do with other people's feelings is make them go away and appease them, right? Or express so much that it's, it's overwhelming to others. That's more than you asked me for. How is that landing? She wasn't, suffering, she wasn't suffering from your listening. She was suffering from the meaning that she was making of watching you listening. Maybe if I could just pursue. Yes. Um, what I think I was suggesting to her was that the solution is probably after we've learned more. And then 
the pressure of a conflict situation, there would be a preference for an easy solution, a quicker solution. Mm -hmm. And so the compassion I feel is, yes, this is going to take longer than she wants it to take. Yes. And I'm just not taking it personally, but yes. I'm, like, I'm getting a little bit on the observation, but the next bit is where I think, <coughs> oh, okay, I have to, as I said, raise yes. the bar. Yes. How, how do I set up a meeting like that so that, hmm, you know, did I somehow contribute to setting up an expectation that it would be that fast? I see. Yeah. So it sounds like in that interaction, what happened for you is that you got more awareness and information about the impact that your strategies were having on the people who were participating in it. And when you saw that the um, impact in some ways kind of created a little bit of distress in one of the people, you're asking yourself the question right now, is there a way that I can enter into that situation differently in the future that might alleviate that? And I think you've answered your own question because what I'm hearing you saying is, I wonder if um, I'm learning that people come wanting and they have ideas of what it's going to look like which is usually you punish the other person and you tell this person they were right publicly and then everybody feels better except for this one um, and if I don't want to do that maybe there's a little bit of information giving and awareness building that I can do on the front end that would change their experience of the process that I want to walk them through is that is, okay yes Not most of us, all of us, all of us do. Yes. Yes. So um, we we may see it slightly differently. Although I do, um, I think I'm understanding what you're saying. Which partly is when you when you hear some of these concepts and you see how they're different from the real world that I live in and the rules that the real world seems to operate by. Um, there's a discomfort that happens for me because I, I want to continue to be competent and effective in this world and I'm kind of putting my toe into this other world that is appealing to me and I, I want to bring a little bit of this in here but I want to stay effective in here and there's a tension building in me that I'm not entirely sure what that's going to look like and it's not really clear to me right now how, uh, how effective that's going to be. Okay. The other is just, and maybe that's the paradox and the tension, that um, so in, po in systems of domination, mm -hmm. like I will say it's a, a college classroom is that the teacher has the way of the power. Mm -hmm. But if you want to co-create a learning environment, mm -hmm. you have to use different strategies, mm -hmm. but yet you're still within that overall system of domination. Okay. And so there's a, you have to kind of, kind of have a parallel <coughs> So it may be that you and I use slightly different language, and I don't know if this is going to help. Within systems of collaboration and nonviolence, we still have layers of expertise and leadership. And we still have people who are decision makers. And we still have people who take the lead and people who choose to follow. The, the, the paradigm shift is that I would like you, let's take this room, this is a domination system, I get airtime and you show up and you pay me to have the airtime and you submit to receiving what it is that I'm laying down and have your private experience of which pieces you want to let in and which pieces you don't. No different than any other domination system. Um, so if I'm really going to be like domination system, 
then I'm going to buy into the idea that I'm the only person in the room with a particular expertise and all of you are here to receive my information. And if any of you are questioning, then I'm going to see that as you not really get it, because of course I'm right, and then I want to sort of educate you in a way that, that brainwashes you and indoctrinates you into some kind of a, a way of thinking and being. That would be domination. And then those of you who are like, that's just the craziest training and I'm never going back, then I'm going to jackal you, right? I'm going to have all kinds of thoughts about, well, those people just weren't ready to learn. Because then I get self-righteous and superior because that's what we do in that system. This for me, this shift is an internal experience that creates a qualitatively different experience where when I'm in the room with you, I, I know that I have walked a long way down a particular path that some of you may or may not find useful. And I'm willing to share with you the things that I've learned and that I have found helpful. But every time that I run a training or run a practice group, I am questioning the, co the concepts along with you again and again in order to find out where the limits are, what the um, parameters of the tool might be, um, and we are co-creating and I am learning as much as you are. And I strive in the way that I run the trainings to remain a human being with the rest of you because I know that I, I have more structural power in this situation, which means that I need to lower the threshold for you to critique me more than if you were the expert and I was the student. Is that making sense? So the whole system of moving into collaboration also requires working with power differently. Now I want to, now I want to take this the next step. So when I move in systems of domination, I do a lot of work in schools and small businesses locally. A school is a domination system. Not only that, we're trained to control the kids and get them, right? I mean, that's how it is. There's an art, I mean, back to your, your thing early on, about how do I show up in domination systems without perpetuating tools of domination? How do I work with domination? And this is the model not teach piece. I'm not interested in going in and telling other people, oh, look, you're doing this bad domination thing, so change it and be collaborative. <laughs> it doesn't work, right? But, I, but what I strive to do in terms of the practice for myself is, how do I need to internally position myself as an authority figure differently so that people can have an experience of collaboration and an experience of nonviolence as I define it, which we can get into in a little bit. And that for me is the key learning because I will be more effective in working with domination when I'm different. I can stay in a place of choicefulness, of empowerment. I can stay, my experience of it is different. And for me, that is enough. I don't need anyone else to not be domineering, for example, or to not say, well, we just have to do blah, 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 because the model is about how do I work with it? 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 Domination is, how do I go in and change it? Because there's something wrong with it. In the working with it, it transforms. Does that get at? I know that helps you. That's great. OK, OK. <laughs> All right. I'm just wanting to check. And maybe as we go through more of this, there'll hopefully be more connections. Um, good. Are we ready for that? Yes. structure, if you will call it, or a domination structure, whatever you want to call it, willingly because they're interested. And within that milieu of being interested in their commitment to that structured world, I think it's very possible to do things very differently. And still have the same very high expectations. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it could even be more I effective. I that mightily all throughout my residence. Mm -hmm. I bought into it. I mean, I was beaten to death. Mm -hmm. you know, my wife was going to buy that system. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we came to view it as a passage of right. Yes. And all that stuff. Yes. And 
Thank, thank you, because it reminds me of, it's not that we don't have leadership, that we don't make decisions, that we don't have effectiveness. It's that we're trying to make those decisions out of trusting relationships, not out of fear of authority or fear of punitive measures. That I willingly give you the authority to make this decision because you have something, you have an expertise and knowledge that I inherently trust and I know that, you ha that I matter to you. And therefore, I'm more than happy for you to decide what the curriculum is going to be for English language for the class because I trust that you are holding my needs as valuable which is very, very different than I, don't, I come into a learning space or a workspace where I don't think that I intrinsically matter as a human being and I am being used for ends that I'm not sure I'm consenting to. I think that's really, I mean, that's really true in that you know, it helps you why we're doing it. Yes. And that, I don't know why people don't do it. This is why we're doing this really boring exercise 10 times. Yes. Yes. Right. So what you're doing there intuitively is speaking to needs for um, competence, for effectiveness, for meaning, for purpose. And when those needs feel like they're met, people will engage in the activity because it meets their needs. One of the things that Marshall Rosenberg um, has said is that you have never done anything in your life that was not in the service of a deep need of yours that every single thing that you've done in your life has been your best attempt to meet a deep need that you had in that moment. All, and, and all we really have are tragic strategies. And so it's not that you're doing right and wrong things per se, it's just that there are varying degrees of effectiveness that, that have direct correlation to how connected you are to the need you are trying to meet. And so what we want are organizations and relationships and systems that the invitation is that become more needs-based and have an awareness of more of the data so that we're not just simply passing down old strategies that are outdated and no longer work for the kind of world that we're living in today. Okay, yes. Quick yes, you can. About that line and maybe this is more of a circle, but yep. um, I do a lot of observing, yep. which helps me evaluate situations. Yes. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This is, this, is, this is what I'm saying. There is paradox in here because in order to um, observe, there's a part of you that also needs to evaluate. So, you know, these things are not mutually exclusive. We're just going to pull them apart in sort of false boxes for a while in order to work with them differently. Yeah, okay. Ready to move on? Because I do want to get through this whole model before we break for lunch today. <laughs> and so, okay, next dialectic. There are four of these that we're going to work with. The next one is the being aware of my thinking versus my feeling data. Um, Sir Ken Robinson has a fabulous TED talk out there. Some of you may be familiar with it, where he talks about. Um, how our systems of education are set up. And one of the things that he says in, in his talk is that from about five onwards, we um, cut people off at the neck and we value everything that is above the neck and we forget everything that is embodied. And I think he makes some funny comment about how our bodies exist to carry our heads around. Yes? yes? <laughs> And so many of us, this is a beautiful image that speaks to this dichotomy that as we go through schools, we are, um, you know, we are trained in evaluation, analysis, thinking, critical thinking, and that part of our functioning is really um, celebrated, rewarded, valued, seen, and so we have a lot of attention on that. And then we learn that our feelings, we can learn all kinds of things about our feelings, and we could probably do a whole day on emotions. But essentially, I'm gonna boil it down to two simple things. Either your feelings are inappropriate and not welcome, so make them go away, or if you ramp up your feelings, you can scare other people enough to get what you want, okay? So this is how many of us re relate to feelings. 
and, um, and depending on a lot of experiences that you bring through your lifetime to this moment, you will be differently controlled by other people's feelings. So it may be that you find it difficult to be present to somebody who's angry. That is a common one. That if somebody gets angry enough around me, I will go scared and I will start doing my defensive maneuvering back to the, the piece and I'll start accommodating them. And so if you're the one getting angry, you might learn, oh, that's an interesting strategy. I can get more of what I want if I ramp my feelings up. And so now I play them and I ramp them and we're not doing this consciously. I mean, don't hear this like you're nefariously planning this. We just learn these habits. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna pause there and I'm, I'm just gonna come back to this. We don't want to numb out and we don't want to act out. What we want to do with our feelings is bring our observation mm -hmm. to our feelings. And one, this is going to sound so obvious, we feel our feelings. That's mm -hmm. all you do with it. It is nothing more than neutral data that your body provides for you about how you are perceiving a situation and to what degree your needs are being met or unmet. You wake up in the morning, hopefully in an ideal situation, you're feeling refreshed because your need for rest and rejuvenation was just met. And you might be feeling a little hungry because your body hasn't had fuel for 12 hours and is sending you a signal that it needs a little bit of fuel. And you might be feeling thirsty because you haven't had anything to drink for 12 hours and your body is letting you know that it needs some more fluid inside of it. So you take your feeling of hungry and thirsty and you go and you find a strategy to meet those needs and you meet the needs and the hunger and the thirst goes away, you're back in homeostasis. And then as you move through your day doing all of the things that you are doing, over time, your body begins to let you know that you start feeling tired because your need for rest is coming up again. It's very simple, uh, in theory, right? We don't do this with our emotions. Many of us don't even do this with our bodies to the degree that we're out of touch with our bodies and not valuing the signals from our bodies because we've been taught in a competitive, individualistic culture that you just need to bite the bullet and override everything. So we, we get up into our heads and we miss a lot of data. And the data that is provided to us through our feelings and our needs are about what is going to make your life more wonderful. What do you need to survive and thrive? That information is internally generated for you all the time. And so this dialectic, and the next one that we're going to talk about, is about developing a different relationship with my feelings, where I develop the capacity to tolerate negative emotion, or what I previously evaluated as negative emotion. It's about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. So where this plays out in schools for me a lot is working with students that the frustration you're feeling actually means something good. It's okay to tolerate frustration. It's okay for learning to feel uncomfortable. You don't always have to feel good for things to be okay. And um, to your situation, the employment situation, it's fine to have a little bit of vulnerability and anxiousness coming up when we're in the middle of an ambiguous process where you can't see the end. That your feelings are simply telling you about your qualitative experience as you go. You don't want to numb out from them. You also don't want to give them too much power. And in nonviolent communication, what we really practice is connecting our feelings to our deep underlying needs. And this is a place where you may want to grab out your um, feeling and needs sheets because the way we use the word needs in this communication model is very, very different than the cultural way that we use the word needs. Culturally, when we talk about needy people, it's a negative thing. 
right? Needy people are clingy and dependent and weak and high maintenance and not something that any of us would want to be. So what we're talking about here, when we're talking about the concept of universal human needs, Mickey Cashton, a trainer out of um, San Francisco who does a lot of work in convergent facilitation, calls it the non-controversial essence. So what is the non-controversial essence that the people in the situation share? This is the place where we have no conflict with others. It is also the place that in large part gives rise to our feelings. When my needs are well met, I'm likely to feel a variety of good things that lets me know that I'm thriving. I'm enjoying something. Something is really meeting my needs. When my feelings inch towards the more unpleasant internal alert system feelings, they're designed to bring my attention to what it is that I'm needing. If I'm feeling really lonely, I can ask myself, what am I needing? Possibly companionship. If I know that I'm needing companionship, I now have options to get my needs met. And I can choose some strategies, that's on the other side here, that are well aligned to these needs. If my relationship with my feelings is that there are good feelings and bad feelings, and if I feel bad because I was brought up in deserve culture, then it means I am bad, right? You should feel bad because there's something wrong with you. Now I'm feeling lonely, then I'm likely to have a lot of thinking kick in that says, wow, I'm such a loser. Oh, I'm lonely. I have no friends. Oh, I'm lonely. Nobody likes me. So what many of us do is we have a feeling and we, th we go straight to our thinking, which we've been trained to do. And we need to make meaning of our feelings. So, oh, I'm really angry. It must be because you blah, 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 blah. We're back in an old frame. Something is wrong. So a big piece of this practice is getting out of the idea that feelings tell us that something is right and wrong. And instead, have the self-discipline internally of beginning to ask yourself, I'm feeling something. What am I needing? I'm feeling frustrated. What needs of mine are up? I'm feeling sad. What deep need do I have? Because when I'm connected with my needs, I have more options and my strategies are going to be more effectively aligned to what's actually going to help the situation. This is not our habit. Our habit culturally is to not know what we're feeling a lot of the time. Certainly, we don't have a literacy of our needs most of the time. But I know what is wrong with me and you. And I know what I think about all of these patterns that we are in. And I certainly have a lot of ideas of how I need to be different or how you need to be different. And then I'm going to make a lot of demands on you or me right here. And I'm going to set us up in a power struggle. And this conflict can become intractable and unenjoyable and can create more suffering. When I'm able to move into a place of observing, I start practicing my ability to track the internal sense of how things are landing on me and what is happening inside of me without being reactive to it. I have the self-discipline and the practice of automatically beginning to imagine, what am I really needing right now? Then I can come up with some ideas where what I start practicing over here is making requests. These are like little um, invitations to make my life more wonderful. But they're nothing more than an invitation. If you say yes, I'll be delighted. If you say no, I'll be fine. Because it's just one idea. I'm throwing out a strategy here in my request. And then we are sort of co-creating what's going to work for both of us. Because in the um, 
you know, in the collaborative, nonviolent communication frame, the other thing that's very different is that up here, I am holding your needs plus my needs plus our needs as important and valuable and mattering. So my internal positioning is that what I am needing is important and it matters. What you are needing is important and it matters. And what we as a community are needing and how our way of being impacts the whole also matters. And so I have three ways of checking out any strategy because I'm caring for the whole. In this frame, I'm likely to think it's either you or me, them or us. In terms of when I'm in dialogue or when I'm trying to solve something. Because this frame tends to be more dualistic, which tends to lead to more disconnection. So in terms of the very basic communication model, I would use it in a relationship where my desire to connect with and understand another person in order to build relational trust before we go into any kind of strategizing is a priority to me. Because what I'm wanting to do is, is have a relational trusting experience between me and another human being out of which we can use all of this functioning, but it's going to feel very, very different when there's trust that we both matter and that we're working together. And so this is the, I'm gonna connect before I correct. So I will use this model either internally to position myself or between the two of us. And in classical NBC, it'll sound like I will try to enter the conversation with as much observation as I can. I will share depending on the setting. Now let's take this into your personal lives because you'll share feelings more in your personal lives than in your work lives. There are ways that you can adapt this to fit work culture differently than intimate relationship culture. So let's just go personal for a moment. I'm gonna tell you, when you came in with that frying pan, remember when you came in with that frying pan this morning? Yeah, I felt really surprised and, and shocked and a little bit bewildered. And I, in that moment, had a real need for some clarity and understanding of what was happening as I was beginning to wake up. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about what happened for you when you noticed that frying pan in the dishwasher this morning. That would be the, the classical <coughs> NVC model. Okay, what I'm observing, what I remember seeing and hearing or not seeing or not hearing, what came alive in my heart I'm not only sharing everything that's defended and up here, I'm moving down into the rest of you and I, uh, of me and I'm showing you more of me. I'm being more transparent with you than I might normally be. And I'm owning my feelings by letting you know that I'm aware that these are the needs that were activated and I am instantly giving you something you can do to help the situation. I'm leading you into a quality of conversation that is not asking you to defend yourself, explain yourself, tell me what is wrong with you, invite you into some cognitive thing at first. I'm wanting to connect. I'm wanting to understand what was happening for you this morning. And so that's how I would lead in with observation, feeling, need, request. Ideally, if they're speaking the same nonviolent language and they're wanting to get to a place of compassion, he might say to me, yeah, you know, I, I opened up that dishwasher. This is you now speculating empathy. And I saw a frying pan and I remembered you saying that you wouldn't do that. So I really felt angry and surprised and shocked. And, and I was also feeling bewildered because I want, to under, I want more trust in our relationship. And when you say you're going to do something, I'm really wanting to trust that that can be a predictable thing for me. And I'm, I'm curious about what got in the way of you just washing the pan last night. Now there's tone of voice, there's body language, there's everything that's getting activated. This is getting, now we're gonna get into the nuts and bolts of this being very, very complicated. But just on the surface piece of getting the language down, are you seeing how that can be a different frame than the old conversation? Comments on that piece? Yes. In both examples you gave, I heard the request as a request for information, not as a request for action. 
Thank you for naming that. Yes, when we're making requests um, in, in compassionate communication, there's a very particular way that we make them. A request is always stated in the here and now. So we're staying in the present moment. And it's something that is doable. And it's something that is positive, meaning it's what I do want. A request isn't, in the future, would you be willing to be less selfish? Okay? Or in the future, would you be willing to simply do what you said you would do? Because anything about in the future would not be in the frame of nonviolent communication. We're, we're out in strategizing right and wrong ways of being in the future, and we were losing our way. In this moment, in this present moment, what can the person do right now? What can they tell me about, say, reflect back to me right now that's going to help me feel better about this or help me meet a need that I have in this moment? And I, it needs to be something that they can do right now. It very often sounds in language like, I'm wondering if you could tell me about blah, 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 blah. If you're wanting to understand what's happening for them, it could be like I had said, could you tell me about what got in the way of X, Y, and Z? I'm wanting more information. Or you could say, um, let's say that there's something really painful that's up for me. And I might say, you know, I, I'm, I felt really hurt when you waved the frying pan and I got scared. And I'm just wanting to make sure that you're not hearing criticism in that. And I'm wondering if you could tell me back what you're hearing me say. Then he might say, yeah, you're telling me that I don't get to express my feelings. And then I can say, thank you. Thank you for letting me know that. Because he is telling me how he's hearing it, which is what I'm asking for. And then I, I might then say, then let me try that again, because I see I'm not making myself clear. And then I go for the thing that I'm wanting, which very often is empathy in that moment. I'm just wanting to know that you hear how it landed. I'm not saying it was right or wrong. I'm not saying you can never do that. I'm not saying any of those things. I really just want to know that you get that I was scared this morning. Can you tell me that? And then often somebody will say, yeah, I get that you were scared. We've already got more connection with a different kind of language between the two of us in that moment than the old trajectory that we tended to play out for the last 15 years. Is that, does that help? Other questions and comments on this piece? Well, this goes really without saying, but you have to deal with things in the current and when they're small. Well, that's one thing. The other thing, um, in, in the way that I've worked with this model that I have found really useful, mm -hmm. is allowing myself to let things derail the way they've always derailed and having no demand that that's going to be any different. But I've um, really held myself to doing what I think of as repair work. That when I'm really activated, you know, when we go back to this um, initial thing, something happens, and what happens for me is old habits of defensiveness come up. And I'm going to fight or flee, and I'm going to accommodate, and I'm going to make it better, and I'm going to do like my usual crisis management thing that I do in my relationship. And then outside of that moment, I'm looking back on that moment and thinking, ugh. In that moment, I want to make sure I'm not judging myself. Okay? I, I want to internally think to myself, what's my observation of what happened? How am I feeling now as I'm thinking about it? How did my choices earlier on today meet my needs and not meet my needs? And what options do I have now in this present moment to revisit that interaction with the person who was involved and debrief in a way that serves connection, compassion, mutual learning, mutual growth, mutual awareness building without making either of us wrong. And that then makes it a very different kind of learning. And with time, at first, nobody in my family believed that I had made any shift, right? So at first, I'm just talking differently and they're super wary and suspicious. And with time, there is a trust that has developed that when I want to debrief a situation, it's not coming from the old frame of, I'm, it's going to be a gotcha. 
right? There's much more of a, we've had enough experiences now where we can have a huge blowout in the morning and in the afternoon we can sit down and say, you know, I want to debrief. And we can sit down and we have a shared understanding of how that conversation is going to be different. That we're both imperfect human beings with old patterns and how do we love each other anyway? And this is the communication tool that allows me to bridge those two things. That you don't then have to suddenly show up perfectly. You get to show up warts and all with all of the old stuff, but we have a way of staying connected and loving and compassionate with ourselves and others anyway. Does that add another option to the one of do it with the small things as well? What time is it? OK, so what I think would be most useful right now is for you to get into groups of about four, um, circle up with just you know, three other people in the room, and take a little bit of time to debrief. This was a lot of information this morning. We got through half of it. OK, we got through the expressing piece. This afternoon, we'll talk about how do you receive other people, the, the listening piece. How do I receive this through this model? Um, and then over lunch, what I would suggest you do is think a little bit about the, um, the situation that you're bringing in and how, how you might work with observation, feeling, need, and request with the situation that you were bringing in. So go ahead and debrief. I'll make a few more comments before we break for lunch. Um, and, I, and that gives you a sense of what we have for the rest of the day. Sound good? Okay, so club. <laughs>